Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Joshua from uh, from the Naval Research Lab. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Um, if you could bring up my slides, um, I could at least start to introduce myself. So, yeah, my name is Josh Kossuth. I'm a program officer at the Office of Naval Research. So uh, I was formerly at the Naval Research Laboratory um, doing research myself, and uh, now I uh, manage the programs for that. So this slideshow I'll show you is uh, not specifically geared towards UAS, but um, some of the research efforts that ONR is funding in general for aviation. Um, great. Um, Looks like it's coming up a little cut off. Um, suffice um, it to Jennifer, say, I guess we'll just move on. To... Yep, yeah, sorry. Jennifer, do you want to try on? Maybe it's my, I think it's my, I had problems with this um, presentation. Jennifer, do you have it up to try? That's what I get for sending a PDF. <laughs> well, so anyway, I could uh, move on while we figure this out since it's not too big of a deal. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was just a little bit of how um, we kind of do research uh, and divide up those uh, research areas at the Office of Naval Research. Um, then I'm going to move into some examples of some of the programs that uh, help with aviation for the Navy, um, starting with some of the advanced prototypes uh, that are pretty close or have already transitioned to operations, and you'll see those projects there. Um, some applied research, which uh, is a little bit more, uh, we need to put a little bit more effort to see if we can uh, make something interesting work out of it. And then a uh, upcoming basic research campaign called Magpie, which is really looking at some fundamental processes of the boundary layer and trying to understand some of the, uh, the characteristics of the thermodynamics and dynamics on small scales and see if we can um, represent some of those processes given the coarser numerical models or um, satellite observations we have. So if we move on to the next slide, um, that's just going to show an overview of, um, great, so slide three would be where I'm at now. Um, and that's going to show kind of a overview of how we get from um, basic research funding through an applied project, um, uh, then prototyping, which will get us to um, transitioning into operations. Perfect. Um, so, um, O and R, we cover all the scope that's listed there from 6.1 through 6.4. So um, we're funding basic research that tries to understand some processes in meteorology or new theories, some conceptual models. Um, in our applied research program, 6.2, um, we're adapting some of those new technology, developing algorithms, um, using case studies with real data. And in 6.4, um, that's where we start integrating those with existing systems and transition it to the operational partner. On the right there, you see in those yellow boxes, those are just examples of administrative bodies so that the uh, different naval stakeholders um, take place and uh, take part in this process as we go. And on the left just shows some of the other sponsors and funding that happens. So let's move to the next slide and start getting to some examples of some research. Um, so the first one is looking at um, something that we transitioned, uh, I think it was in 2019, that has to do with um, trying to bias correct statistically some of the errors we have in the data um, when we're trying to get some sensible weather observations. So um, in this example, um, we're looking at, um, if we can move to the next slide, slide four. Um, there we go, thank you. Um, so we're seeing um, how if we take observations in a near coastal areas, um, obviously there's a lot of different land character, there's a lot of characteristics that are different in the meteorology between the ocean and the land. Um, and so what we've done, if we updated some of our statistics and our post-processing to take that into account um, by, um, by going and training the observational data sets um, using only the relevant um, near data points that represent the model data point we're trying, to, um, we're trying to resolve. So in this case, we could see that we separated our biases between land and sea contrast um, so that we could focus on those problems without contamination in the other. And so that transitioned in 2019, and we're trying to use these algorithms to um, move ahead with more smarter ways to um, look at some of our meteorological data, including topography and other land sea differences. On well, the next slide um, is where we took this project next, which is um, now applying that to certain aviation um, difficulties. And so that we know that there's a lot of issues, especially with things that we care about that aren't in model predictions and um, forecast models, icing, uh, turbulence, clouds, um, 
or especially important factors, and they're not really, uh, those aren't physical state variables. And so um, taking some of those concepts from the last project, we're doing work on um, taking the probability distributions and correcting them for known biases um, with observation data, um, recalibrating the data so that we have a um, calibrated set of diagnostics to support aviation forecasts given our um, Navy global system. Um, so on the top right is where you can see just the line graph of how the um, uh, those black dots are um, under dispersed and characterizing some of those processes. And then the red line shows that we're close to the um, um, ideal line. And the bottom right just shows a graphic of icing um, for a specific forecast time in the global model. And so um, we're moving forward with that right now. We have um, some simple things like flight level temperatures and winds, and um, we're, we're still doing testing for some of the more um, second order, uh, higher order effects like the turbulence and icing. And the next slide is um, another project that's uh, fairly close or has already mostly transitioned um, to support the Triton um, unmanned aerial vehicle. Um, this is a, a support project to take the entire process of taking, uh, of getting that data, uh, meteorological data um, coming up with the um, preparation for the flights and automating most of that so that the um, aerographers may can spend their time um, focusing on the analysis of the data and creating that forecast rather than trying to look up all the data and compile it together and fill out all the forms. So the bottom right shows kind of a workflow um, that's been automated um, that they used to have to ham jam before. And um, that has just been transitioned last year and is um, right now we're continuing updates to be able to make that process smoother and um, make those connections so that the data that we need goes into uh, uh, into the forecaster's hands to be able to focus on that forecasting problem itself. Okay, so on the next slide, um, we're going to start to move towards kind of where we're going with a more basic research area, which is um, how do we take all of this data that we've seen and more smartly put it together for it, uh, our best sort of analysis or forecast. Um, talks earlier in this uh, session have shown that um, you know we have a lot of interesting data but there's it's, it's hard to put it be able to put it together still tell a consistent message or at least be able to deliver the ops that we're taking and give it to a specific forecaster and so the geolocated information processing system or geoips is an or open source python software developed at the naval research lab to um, to do that capability um, in particular it's focused on satellite data for now um, but ultimately we're starting to bring in um, numerical model output and observations. And the goal is to take all these different formats of data and the calibrations and standards and put them together into uh, a common metadata analysis so that we can start fusing them together and come up with added value products. Um, on the bottom right, it's kind of hard to see, but there's specific satellite data that's um, taking into account multiple channels to be able to discriminate um, clouds versus snow or uh, contrails versus other cirrus clouds um, or fires from um, other low-level uh, heat signatures. Um, so using GeoWips on the next slide, one of the more interesting directions we're just starting in the next year is called our Overcast project on uh, slide eight. And what we're trying to do there is um, using GeoWips, get at a uh, four-dimensional evaluation of clouds, aerosols, water, visibility in the atmosphere. Um, so ultimately, um, you know, it's it's easy to get cloud tops from satellite, and so there's some other derived products, but it's really hard to get bases um, to be able to see where your your ceilings are, or um, you know, if there's gaps in the clouds, what's your slant path visibility? Um, there might be better ways or paths to uh, to navigate that you can't see from just a nadir look on satellites um, or even the model data. So um, we're just starting this project now to leverage that GeoF system to combine NOAA and NASA algorithms. Um, other open source uh, data sets and, uh, and uh, software that takes into account uh, geostationary and polar data, develop uh, three-dimensional structures from that. Uh, the bottom left image is from CIRA at Colorado State, where they're, um, or they're doing those tests to be able to come up with a 3D cloud analysis. We're using machine learning techniques in the middle, and um, we're going to improve parameterizations and models that we can see on the right. So finally, um, the second to last slide just shows some of base, an example of basic research that we're doing that we're hoping that will help with our UAV and other av aviation um, problems. And this is MAGPIE. Um, 
we're looking at moisture and aerosol gradients and the physics of inversion evolution in the boundary layer. Um, specifically, since we're the Navy, we focus on the, um, the marine boundary layer. But um, the gist of the problem here is that if you look on the right figures, there's a large variability uh, in moisture, temperature, um, dynamics. Um, and that has a substantial impact on um, different operations that we like to do, um, not the least of which would be aircraft operations. And so given all that variability, we'd like to be able to, um, we're going to have a few field campaigns to measure what those processes look like in a, in a bulk sense, see if we could represent some of those stochastic processes in large scale models and um, understand the subgrid scale variability of weather processes that happen on local scales from 10 to 100 meters um, and how that's represented in course models and what we could do about that. So the last slide, um, I could talk through it or um, just leave it up, but that just discusses um, some of the session topic questions that were brought up. Um, so I tried to summarize with that. So I could take questions or uh, move on, but thank you. Thank you. I think one from um, Don, if he still has his hand up. Oh, no, I took my hand down, but um, but was just a comment. When I see this great work being done, um, and I'm, again, thinking from a standards perspective about how we're going to know the goodness of all these products and and who's, you know, how are we going to track the methodologies and to make sure that, you know, I'm not saying your science isn't good. I'm using this as an example. Um, this, again, goes back to, you know, if we're thinking about an explosion of data and an explosion of new techniques and capabilities to do modeling and prediction, how does the aviation community understand, you know, what is good science, what's okay science, what's just somebody trying to get a product out, right? And 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 so I think this is just something I want to point out in this to the group is to think about that, right? Because we've got to manage, you know, if you look at what, what the social media sites are doing, there's a lot of people out there today that are doing forecasting that aren't even meteorologists, right? Um, and part of our challenge as a community is how do we maintain the standards that we know we need to maintain, but open this up so that private sector can participate because that's how we're going to accelerate our whole progress as a nation, right? So these just uh, that was the thoughts I was having when I raised my hand. So uh, since this is my talk, I'll respond to it quickly. Um, I concur completely. I mean, I don't. I'm not very familiar with this community. Um, I focus more on uh, my areas of expertise and naval problems, but I think this is exactly the forum to do that. Um, I don't have expertise in the precise problems you have, but um, I've got other areas that um, I know what I'm talking about, and I think it's good for us to discuss, you know, where I've been focusing, where you've been focusing, what our needs are, and we could come together on this. But I think it's exactly these meetings like this where we have other expertise um, rather than a free for all. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't even really addressing your 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 uh, presentation just got me thinking about the different complexities of how our science is moving. And it wasn't really addressing your particular um, presentation, but in general, when I when I think about this, how are we going to manage, you know, the science standards right around aviation weather? That that was just a general comment. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, with that, um, Rob Randall, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rob Randall. I work down at uh, White Sands Missile Range for the Army Research Lab. For those who don't know where that is, it's in New Mexico and about it's near Las Cruces, New Mexico, about an hour north of uh, El Paso, Texas, just so you understand where, where we're sitting. Um, can you see my slides by chance? Yes, but not in presentation mode. OK, I just put it in there. It should transition to it. Um, so I see the uh, time's running short, so I'll, I'll buzz through this pretty quick. Uh, we don't have this large portfolio that really uh, speaks to this community, but we have some things, some capabilities, and there are a few research projects that uh, we're entertaining uh, that go down this road. So I'll just jump right into it. Um, this here is a meteorological sensor array that we have built out on the Hornada Experimental Range. It's USDA in conjunction with New Mexico State University. Uh, you'll see the San Andreas Mountains. East of that is the actual White Sands um, uh, National Park. 
and uh, and then south of that is uh, Las Cruces and um, mainly where I was just describing. So what you see here, we have this is the portion that's done. We have different configurations across the uh, the array. We have a little micro scale uh, set up towers up into the foothills. Um, really, our goal is to understand the uh, complex terrain, uh, boundary layer processes, land surface processes, uh, and how they impact um, DOD systems. And so that's that's really our goal at the basic research level. And Rob, the so, slides weren't advancing. Is it, they are not. It might be a, no. It was bandwidth. Or do you want me to try it? Um, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Maybe you should try it. I'll no. stop sharing. Okay. <laughs> I was hoping I could alleviate uh, problems you guys were having on your side. Excellent. Um, so this is the meteorological sensor that I was talking about. And so we do have a UAS runway out there. Uh, we have not uh, put a, a UAS out there yet or run quadcopters quite yet. We're getting to, we're learning more processes and again, uh, resource constraint on that aspect, but uh, it does have the capability. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, I'll just briefly go over what's on a lot. That's a 30 meter tower uh, on a three or three towers. We have full surface energy budget and down and on all the towers, we have the heat flux and all the ground sensors. Um, so we can understand soil moistures and things like that. Uh, next slide. Um, and then we have the capability out there on the Hornada to do things like multiple synchronized LIDARs, get a virtual winds, and um, and just so we can understand what the boundary layer looks like as we're as we uh, as we're trying to understand the processes going out there. The really the micro scale stuff that we're learning we're uh, continuing to find. So next slide, please. Um, and so, uh, as I said, our process is really about the surface processes, environmental state, how does that affect the Army systems? We do a lot of uh, uh, dust type research out there with the Corps of Engineers, but uh, we really want to understand how this, again, how this stuff affects uh, Army systems, including UAV. Next slide. So um, I will just go over a couple of the initiatives. I'm not going to go into detail here since how we're short. Uh, but one uh, initiative we did take in, in conjunction with NMSU, uh, we have an adjunct professor that works out here and um, he had a PhD student that's just finishing this up. So uh, we took a UAS uh, rotor, uh, a small rotor UAS, you can kind of see a little bit, you can kind of see it in the right hand picture there, but um, put it through a wind tunnel and the whole goal is to understand uh, the turbulence around those to understand where sensors could be placed on the on the uh, craft so that it, we could get accurate readings or if we could possibly um, get corrections, you know, have a model to to do corrections based on um, forward motion, reverse motion, up, down, uh, you name it. So that was the thrust of this project in general. Uh, next slide. Um, just some cool pictures, I think, of uh, of the. Uh, inside of the wind tunnel as we're trying to understand that sort of stuff. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, and I think uh, they're still working through some of these next uh, corrections on how to do your velocity corrections. And this one, of course, is on uh, forward flight. But if you go to the next slide, I'll go to the next major initiative we really have had over the years, and it's called automated impacts routing. And it's really a software system that calculates uh, really uh, paths through the atmosphere based on the environmental effects and uh, obstacles along that path. Uh, and so the idea is you put weather data in or model data in and uh, it will quickly calculate a, a four dimensional route uh, path. Um, and you can see all the specifics here written in Java in just 3D, puts it out in uh, OGC and into uh, standard Google Earth. And so this has been around a while. It's been uh, implemented into the Army system, the D6A, for those that know what I'm talking about there, but that's really where the weather is um, is viewed in the Army. Uh, so that's a, a new addition to that. Next slide. Uh, but the latest, in the last couple of years, we had an SBIR. Um, and so that, oh, so here's just some images of the paths that it can find and the, and the different examples. Next slide, please. And, and it can be multi, you know, different uh, scales and res 
resolutions can be nested together. And so that's just a capability. Next slide. Last couple of years, we had an S, uh, SBIR where, um, and the whole goal was take the routing system, embed it on, a, on an air or UAS airframe, and, and then with input of weather data, have it autonomously um, route, you know, create a route using air, and then autonomously just steer around those hazards as it goes. So uh, that was demonstrated back in September 2019. Um, they did it in July 2020. It was uh, it was uh, advanced to where they were uh, getting obstacle data sent between drones during flight, and then it was able to autonomously steer around those. And then uh, this latest one at uh, or yeah, end of last year, October 2020, um, the company f uh, mounted a forward mounting sensor, and um, I think if you go to the next slide, it'll kind of show it. And then they placed. And they really just a, a, a real simple, they said, okay, anything red that you come into is now a new obstacle that you need to input and reroute around. And so they went out there and uh, tested that and that was very successful. And so this is just, is just where we're going is an autonomous environmentally aware uh, UAS using, uh, using the ARL developed technology. So, and I think this is the end of my brief. And so, uh, yep. So I, I know there's probably not time for questions, but if you want to put anything in the chat, I'll gladly answer it. Thank you very much. Let me see if we, yeah, cue questions over to the chat and I will change my screens around. Um, and the next, the bringing up is our last part is a panel session and um, not being able to scan down through, I'm hoping Mr. Um, Jack K, Michael Shapiro, and Colonel Diller were able to join us. Uh, Jack K is on in here. They've been on for a while, quietly. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, this is Lieutenant Colonel Tom Maher. I'm filling in for Colonel Diller uh, this afternoon from AFWORKS and Air uh, Force. Uh, thank you, Tom. I saw you also lurking. <laughs> And you've got Mike um, Shapiro from DOT as well. Ah, uh, thank you very much. I pre I definitely appreciate all your time. Um, your time. Can I um let you go once around the room to formally introduce yourselves? I'm um, sure. I'll I'll start. So, um, like I said, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tom Maher, um, Active Duty Air Force, um, with AFWORKS. Um, so we are a directorate within the Air Force Research Lab. And we focus on three kind of main things, the overall cyber sitter program for the Air Force through our app ventures arm, uh, the Spark, which kind of is our internal innovation, and then Prime, which is where is what I run, and that's focused on um, transitioning dual use technologies and specifically what the, our main program right now is Agility Prime, which is focused on uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, which kind of how we are interested in this conversation of, of kind of the future, where those vehicles go, and then what sort of weather information they require for safe operations and sometimes operations uh, in the future based on some of the, the roadmaps uh, out there. Happy to be here and thank you very much. Thank you. Jack? Yep, I'm uh, Jack Kay. I'm the Associate Director for Research in the Earth Science Division at uh, NASA headquarters. Uh, we're part of the Science Mission Directorate um, here in DC. Michael, over to you. Hi there, I'm, I'm Michael Shapiro. I'm Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy over at the Department of Transportation and focus on a lot of our department's um, innovation activities, including on advanced air mobility, UAS, and, and kind of many of the other technologies before us today. No, th um, thank you all for joining us. So we, we've spent um, a the first part of the um, briefing in the today's events was kind of talking about the operationals and what is going on across the federal government in the SUA, mostly around SUAS, but definitely in aviation and, and some weather needs. And then we looked towards the you know potential future for the system. And then we um, the last session here was on the different research activities. So I was hoping to focus this panel on how do we get from where we're at today with re with research and things and transition that to a plan and roadmap for the system? So 
um, whether you guys want to talk about current efforts that you're doing to look toward a future system or in general on how we transition research to operations. I'm um, looking forward to hearing your thoughts and then seeing if we have um, questions from the audience. So I guess I'll, I'll get it started a little bit with some of our in the Air Force's interest and in what we've looked at from a kind of the technologies and things we've looked at is how do you get uh, transportable weather solutions more so for uh, austere field ops. So one of our, our special ops types of folks go in and use a new field they have to set up some weather information uh, and sensors and kits. And so we're looking at how do we miniaturize those things and there are stuff out there that are certainly um, geared a little bit towards the commercial sector and then some that maybe a little more ruggedized on what we're interested in. But what comes with that is then some connectivity. Um, we look at some satellite connectivity to, to get a little bit further range, but certainly from a commercial perspective, using those connections uh, with your uh, commercial such as LTE or, or, or 5G connections to kind of set up a network of that type of uh, weather information is one road that that kind of goes down commercial path. So from the airport perspective, we're looking at from tactical situations, but then the important part is that we are interested in, certainly with AFWERX and our cyber program of how we transition those over and leverage the dual use um, focused technologies that exist in the commercial space. Um, so I'll be honest, we're not really focused on what that, the overall architecture on the commercial side, we want to leverage what is being developed on that, on that front. Over. Okay, uh, did you want me to go? Um, yes, please. It seems like it's a good order. <laughs> okay, I can't remember the, the order. So I don't have charts and, and I may have too many talking points. So uh, if I'm getting greedy in time, just let me know and I'll, I'll jump ahead. Um, but that uh, uh, research to operations has been a longstanding challenge in the government. Um, and uh, it's also a challenge to go the other way to you know see what the operations are, are asking and how the research can help with that. At NASA, in particular, we have an applied sciences program uh, that works to transition results into applications in areas like ecological forecasting and, and uh, water resources and food security and disasters. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the things that we do within the research program. Um, in the meteorology realm, we've had a, a few mechanisms, the Joint Center for Satellite Data Assimilation, um, uh, really looking to assimilate NASA data and uh, models into all the assimilation systems in the U.S. and uh, the short-term prediction research and transition center to help uh, operational forecasters uh, utilize NASA data in, in what they do. Um, one of my other roles now is as the uh, a, a co-chair of the uh, Committee on uh, Research and Innovation under ICAMS, the Interagency Council for Advancing Meteorological Services that got set up under the previous administration and uh, sort of uh, emphasized uh, under the current one uh, to enhance the ability of the federal enterprise to link knowledge to services to broaden the participant list beyond the agencies that were the primary participants in the uh, old uh, Office of Federal Coordinator for um, Meteorology. Uh, and NASA has uh, co-chair roles in two of the four ICAMS committees. Um, in general, what we do in NASA Earth Science is to advance uh, uh, science and global Earth system science, including climate and weather, um, using a mix of satellite observations, airborne observations, surface-based uh, surface observations, modeling, data analysis, uh, using scientists at S centers and the broader community, academia, other government agencies, private sector, nonprofit, mostly competed. Um, one of our focus areas, the one that may be most relevant here is the weather and atmospheric dynamics focus area that surveyed the community through an RFI recently in the process of developing a guide for the focus area in the future. One of the things that that focus area does in particular is to work closely with our, uh, SDO, our Earth Science Technology Office on some of the technology demonstrations, especially uh, miniaturizing instruments and research and their new observing strategy um, with the ultimate goal that the NOS will allow autonomous vehicles to coordinately observe predefined events or features um, and uh, those that may be opportunistically identified by AI ML algorithms. The satellite program that we have that has 20 plus operating satellites through what we call the program of record gets a lot of data about atmospheric profiles, temperature, weather, precipitation, aerosols, clouds, uh, using this Earth System Science perspective, so as not to just characterize what we see, but to understand and ultimately lead to improvements in predictive capability. 
We use a variety of techniques, including uh, um, uh, active techniques. So we can do things like uh, LIDAR and radar and, and get, say, multi-layer clouds through the radar. Uh, we're also starting to use small satellites, which we had not uh, previously. Our airborne program makes use of NASA platforms, sensor systems, people, and opportunities. Um, and right now, some of the foci of that include aerosol cloud interactions, uh, convections in the tropics in the relation to wind patterns, uh, looking at snowfall and stratotrope exchange of weather vapor. In the past, we've done things like atmospheric transport of fire emissions and aerosols, clouds, and uh, Asian monsoon. Um, and uh, the modeling efforts tend to um, look at <coughs> a range from big modeling systems, including those used for climate data simulation reanalysis and process models like for clouds. Um, we are engaged in purchasing and distributing commercial data. Um, initially, uh, both uh, so the GNSS uh, radio occultation um, and some uh, surface uh, optical imagery, but we're, we're purchasing additional data for evaluation and looking to onboard others. And uh, note that the decadal survey from the National Academies that was done in late 2017, 2018, um, made calls for a significant new observational capability as part of what we're calling the Earth Surface Observatory including designated observables through uh, aerosols, clouds, convection, precipitation, or ACCP, uh, future observable that's now in the pre-phase A study. They also identified some topics for what would be called explorer missions. And then perhaps quite relevant here is uh, incubation activity for areas that were seen as not quite ready for a full-up satellite uh, mission, but which could really benefit from both um, uh, fundamental research or you know, sort of use inspired research and uh, technology development. Uh, so um, one of those two was planetary boundary layer, the other was surface topography and vegetation. But for, but for both of them, what we did is we had a solicitation to develop a team to lay out a plan for what we might do in the years ahead. Um, we used that plan to develop a solicitation which is out and closes nine days from now. So uh, if you can actually see, I don't print out much these days, but this is one that we have that shows the plan that's available online um, and um, uh, where, where you can get some information because I think in a lot of the talks before you see that there's new capabilities that, that may provide ways of looking at the planetary boundary layer because there's a sense that there's no single technique that's really going to get us what we need to know about the planetary boundary layer and we have to think um, imaginatively about how to integrate data from a variety of remote sensing, you know, in situ and surface-based measurements um, uh, uh, for that. You know, I should say that, um, you know, relative to um, aviation, um, we, we, do, we do have a history of working with, um, I guess, the predecessor to NASA's Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate going back into the 90s on the atmospheric effects of aviation program and um, also note some ARMD use of our platforms and sensors and uh, as we look towards this, we're um, welcome additional opportunities to interact in the future. And I didn't talk so much about UASs, but I think because we're really interested in the, the, the so the, the underlying science and um, how that one turns that into knowledge and use, that's uh, certainly uh, opportunities there with that. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And happy to go, um, and, and excited to really be here for for this um, for this panel and and getting everyone together here. Um, and you know, it's it's really exciting to see NASA gathering a lot of innovators and uh, inventors and investors to to really talk about technology that um, will will kind of reshape how we think of of flight today. And, and I know we're, we're kind of talking about how we get from where we are today, where there's not a lot of decision support. There's, there's, there's kind of minimal certified weather sources and weather data collected primarily by the federal government so that we can have kind of better information to make uh, risk-based decisions for kind of low altitude vehicles. You know, in our case, thinking about AAM and advanced um, air mobility systems and recognizing that kind of others are, are thinking about the, the types of systems um, uh, you know, un under their jurisdiction and, and where this research might lead. You know, so for us, these kind of systems have the potential to speak to a lot of priorities for us at, at, at DOT. You know, thinking about things like urban congestion, rural access issues, 
on-demand and equitable distribution networks and, and sources of kind of job creation and other transportation problems that we're focused on, on solving as a, as a team. But um, I, I think as you guys have been discussing all day, the key to all of this is the infrastructure that support it. And that includes um, you know, net landing platforms, power supply for fueling, navigation enablers, communication arrays, and of course, critical information such as weather. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to answer how we're uh, going to govern the quality of information and who will ultimately, um, who, who will ultimately provide it. And, and I think the answer today is we all need to collectively figure that out. So at, at, at DOT, we've talked with industry, with academia, with um, a lot of conversations internally and informally. And we've seen concept models where weather is provided by the federal government, local weather stations or private service suppliers. And so for our CONOPS, which we've developed with NASA, we envision kind of service suppliers, but the provision, precision of the weather information needed in a microclimate like a modern city is, is a lot more demanding that we have than what we have in today's forecasting. And the responsibility often is of the pilot to avoid weather becomes a hefty demand when that pilot or the aircraft is, is kind of detached. So it's a promising future, but a daunting challenge to get there. So in response, what we're doing at DOT is we're reinvigorating our non-traditional and emerging transportation technology or net council, which kind of takes a look at all of the new transportation systems across all of our modal administrations and explores how they will work together. In the coming weeks, you'll, you'll see a request for comment coming soon from the department. They'll be asking the public what we need to focus on most. But we already know um, the, one of the answers that, to that question is that kind of advanced air mobility infrastructure is going to be an important part of that. So we've been hard at work developing a charter and a cross-modal team to develop delve into a lot of these kind of policy issues. This work will touch on infrastructure needs, authorities, responsibility, and effects on, on kind of other modes of transportation funding models, environmental responsibility, and of course our North Star of, of safety for everyone using the system. So we have the idea in sight, but we have to get to the hard work of answering these questions. And, and I'm really excited to, to kind of see what we discover and determine in the following years and, and equally excited uh, to see what we will hear from the industry and consumers as we try and make this a collaborative process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, had a question in the chat. Um, what would you consider to be the big elephant in the room that needs to be addressed? So I'll jump first, just um, uh, appreciate Mr. Shapiro's comments on that from DOT's perspective. I think the, bit, the big elephant is it's a very complex problem that um, you're talking about when you talk about the number of sensors and integrating them all, all those data streams into one coherent solution, whether that's from the private sector or whether that's from government uh, owned architectures, how do you actually um, combine and synthesize all the data and who's in charge of running that uh, that part of it to actually provide either the data streams out to um, the autonomous vehicles in the case of what they were talking about with the Army Research Labs and AIR, because that's, that's an incredible capability, but also just to other users throughout uh, the urban air mobility segment, whether that's small UAS or, or larger vehicles or traditional piloted aircraft that we have today. So who actually coordinates all that data and provides that architecture and the standards to combine it and utilize it is probably the, the huge challenge and how we how do we tackle that problem? And where do we start? I guess that's also a good good point. Yeah, I, I guess I would say that it, it may be a, a bit of a wimpy answer, but it, it's it's relating to the, the, the challenge of crossing scales, that on the one hand, there's things that one wants on very small scales um, uh, and, and uh, short periods of time, but one needs sort of this ubiquity of the information where, you, you know, you may want it anywhere, anytime, any place. And when you start talking about that, that mix, you know, it, it's hard. You can't, you know, it, it, you, you can't have it both ways typically. Um, so what one has to try to do is to figure out, you know, what is the right mix of of, uh, uh, of observation and modeling techniques that will let you get the information, you know, that you need when you need it, um, uh, where you need it. But the, the, the associated good news, and it's maybe the other side of the elephant, is that 
um, and, and I'm not a technologist, um, I'm a, a lapse theorist, um, but that the capabilities that are there on, in, in terms of, you know, the new kinds of satellite platforms, we've heard a lot about small UASs and what they can do and, you know, potentially other kinds of, you know, very different kinds of UASs that may give us a lot of situational awareness for high altitude long endurance or high altitude pseudo satellites and the new data techniques and, and uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So, you know, there may be ways to, to package all of these together, but it's, uh, you know, it's a lot that has to get done at the same time. Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo what um, I think my co-panelists have said about the challenges with system integration and technology, which are, are you know, daunting in and of themselves. You know, I'd say another kind of part of the elephant in the room or another big elephant in the room is thinking about some of the like policy and legal um, context around this. And and I, that, that goes to kind of the responsibility for the accuracy of the data and some of the safety concerns. So if, if a pilot is kind of responsible for the safety of flight as, as they kind of are today, but she can't kind of accurately kind of can't actually observe the weather and is, is kind of completely reliant on accurate data, like, like how does that affect or, or who, who is in effect kind of responsible for the safety of the flight, right? And so even if we can get the technology right and, and solve some of those really difficult systems integration challenges and technological challenges and research challenges, which are all hard, there's another elephant in kind of some of the basics of like, well, who owns the liability or who owns the responsibility for making sure that that these kind of new systems are operating in a safe way, especially if you're changing kind of traditional ways of, of being accountable for the for the data and for the measurements. Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo that, I think, and add, add to that, because certainly at NASA, one of the things that um, that we, you know, like many of our partners, partners uh, do take very seriously is the calibration and validation, say, of all the satellites. Um, we are extreme calibration zealots. Uh, we hold ourselves and, our, and, and uh, you know, our community holds us to very high standards. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if we're not the ones providing the data, um, you know, uh, uh, what will others do? What are they willing to share? Um, you know, how do we to compare and allow people to potentially integrate data from multiple data sources, you know, that, that may release certain amounts of information about what they're leading to and, and, and not others, and, and, you know, hope that people can confidently use uh, use all of that. That's, um, uh, you know, it is more complicated when you have a, a more complicated universe of providers. Um, but, you know, Again, if you look, I think, at what we've done internationally um, with a lot of our international partners, where there are a lot of efforts that are in place to help people uh, confidently use data from different sources and integrate it. It may be that the way that we've done things internationally, you know, perhaps may give us some guidance and hope as to how we do that in a more complex ecosystem of uh, uh, information providers. And Jack, inter internationally, are those primarily done as an automated function of how you, which data you trust and how you rack and stack it, or how is that currently done over there? And how would we apply that maybe here? Um, well, certainly like with, with working with other uh, space agencies, um, satellite agencies, we coordinate at high levels through like the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, which has a working group on calibration and validation and coordinating group on meteorological satellites has a, um, uh, a global uh, G6, uh, something global, something, I think, into comparison. I can't remember all my abbreviations, unfortunately. Uh, so, in, you know, you, you have um, uh, mechanisms in place with people talking to each other a lot um, and doing a lot of uh, uh, direct comparisons. Um, so, um, as well as data simulation systems that integrate data from uh, multiple ones. And uh, if there's, just, if there's uh, issues, um, they will, they will find them. You'll see it in the residuals. Thank you. Um, great answers all around. Um, as we come to the close, i um, like to make closing comments or, or thoughts as we kind of look forward or next steps or what you'd like to, what you think the community could do moving forward. 
I think, I think the obvious one is, is just um, just the crosstalk like these forums to see what different agencies are doing. Often, in, uh, not only within our own services, but with, throughout the government, we, often, we always, not always, but often work in stove pipes. So just sitting here and listening to different um, initiatives even within the other services and, uh, and, and what NASA and other agencies have done, it's just in, uh, enlightening to see some of the things that maybe we're interested in that we can leverage that are already taking place within other, other agencies. So just the continuous forums for collaboration on these specific topics uh, uh, is pretty key to keeping them move forward. So thanks for uh, letting me be part, be part of it. Yeah, I'll just say, I think, you know, between the, the things that we're talking about already relative to planetary boundary layer, but I think that seems like that's a, a real interest for what I've been hearing here um, and uh, new techniques that are coming available, whether it's new sensors, new platforms, new data systems. I think it's going to really be a lot of fun to see um, and, and really neat and important and useful science as to how all those pieces can put together and uh, help us tackle something that's uh, that, that that's hard and important. And uh, also remember that uh, it's easy, something like this to fall into a domestic focus, but from our perspective, we're global. And the things that we're looking to do, um, uh, you know, here we would like to help enable um, globally. Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo the comments by my co-panelists. Who And th this is an enormously helpful forum to kind of share interagency efforts and think about the research that we're doing. I would say from our perspective, the ask we'd have of this group, you know, we're standing up a working group for that net council that I mentioned on a lot of the issues involved with advanced air mobility, including related to weather and, and would love to kind of have interagency feedback on that. And in particular, I think you can expect from us a new kind of RFI or request for comment broadly on kind of innovation related issues for the Department of Transportation coming out in the relatively near future where we'd love to get kind of broad input uh, from, from a range of stakeholders. So, um, you know, would appreciate folks responding to that. It's just yet another way to have input in addition to, to great panels like these that we really appreciate folks setting up. Thank you. Um, and as we come close to the time, um, I'd like to echo the you know comments. Great discussion today. Appreciate all the for the information, everyone's time. Um, if anyone has like say any closing observations to to put in the chat, I had a few I'd kind of throw out there. I think the um, from Steve Bradford's um, and PK's panel about the um, need to understand the current and future critical requirements and and understand what we really need and not just a you know a path to get there and then continuing that path all the um, even though it doesn't really continue to meet those future requirements. Um, I think we're going to see a challenge shifting from, um, you know, federally gov federal government provided weather and a centrally managed paradigm to um, future commercially one that's performance based. Um, I think we heard a, bunch, um, a lot of different comments on different data needs and and where and where we can find them i think those that's a great takeaway is to understand those um i found an interesting um, observation in the the federal government's focus really on your on rural over urban so i think that was a very interesting takeaway is to understand the real need um not only for urban weather for aam but also the needs for rural weather um I kind of understand you know had discussion with several of the presenters on data being timely um, and the need for both um, timely data for emergent operations and also data for um, planned operations, um, but also ha has to be weighed with the cost. So, you know, the, co the cost has to be commensurate with the benefit provided. So um, I've got to go back and look and watch the recording again, some great different takeaways, um, but, th but thank you everyone. and. Uh, any other comments folks that want to come on or put in chat but if nothing else i'll say thank you everyone great day and um look forward to the next two days um matt did you want to say something on the next two days um uh, well um I, I would like to just remind all the participants that uh, as nancy has very eloquently stated we do have uh, two more days of uh, of conversations planned uh, tomorrow um ha has i think some some very interesting um, topics being covered, uh, starting off with commercial space and high altitude aviation for the, in the first part of the day. 
Um, the second part of the day will explore um, uh, federal agencies that, that are not aviation related, but which are working on things that could be leveraged and used in, in our um, arenas. Uh, and then, uh, then the final session of the day tomorrow is about the the future of aviation weather uh, from several different uh, federal organizational perspectives. So uh, I, I think uh, again, very interesting discussions. You know, my my only regret, I, I sure do wish we could have had this in person, and we will have this in person. Just, just not right now. And um, and uh, uh, reminding everybody, there is a day four, and day four is kind of our wrap up. And here's what we think we heard on in the areas of of gaps, of synergies, of of overlaps, of of opportunities to collaborate. And I think we've heard. I've I've gleaned a lot of that in two days of discussion, and expect to continue to pick up some more again uh, tomorrow. So we we hope you'll hang in there with us. Same time, same station, same uh, dial in information uh, the next two days. Um, Matthias, let me let me hand the ball over to you and uh, you give us a proper sign off. Oh, I think you did a wonderful job summarizing and I'm looking forward for the next few days. A thank you from my side also for all the speakers and panelists. A wealth of information that was exchanged today that definitely will require time to absorb and digest. So I look forward to uh, picking this up tomorrow again. Thank you. Yeah, and, and Matthias, sorry, I, I, I'm I'm I, I do this all the time to you. I know uh, Nancy said something about reviewing the recordings, which reminds me that there may be some folks on the call who are not aware that the Friends and Partners of Aviation, which is sort of sponsoring, uh, not sort of, which is which is holding this TEM, uh, does have a website. It is uh, at FPA. Dot arrow and uh, and uh, sometime after the meeting has concluded, hopefully not as late as it was last time because yours truly couldn't get his act together. We'll have the minutes and the and the video recordings um, uh, and all the presentations uh, stored on on the, uh, uh, the the meeting summary page and and uh, we invite you all to visit it and if you um, if you are so inclined and want to stay plugged into what FPA is doing. Uh, you could go to the registration page and for the princely sum of zero, register and uh, and sign up for FPA, and then you'll get all of our emails and, and follow up information. And with that, I bid you adieu. Thank you all. See you tomorrow again.